Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Babylon wasn't just a city. It was a kingdom under Nebuchadnezzar. So the captives weren't just stuck in one city. They were scattered all over Syria, Assyria, Media, Persia, and Babylonia. I I want to give you in this lesson a picture of what Babylon was like and why it was specifically Babylon they were taken captive too. There, there is a reason. God has uh, a plan and a purpose for everything he does. And the fact that he took them to Babylon is not without significance. So they were scattered everywhere. The first wave of captives was taken about a hundred years after Hezekiah was king. And it was at this time that Nebuchadnezzar took just part of the beautiful vessels of the temple with him into the land of Shinar. This would be some of the things King Hezekiah had boasted of to the Babylonians years before. The stories had probably been passed down of all the treasures that were to be had in that land. King uh, Hezekiah had taken Babylonian visitors throughout the palaces and everywhere just showing off his treasures big time. So if you've ever watched or read stories of the Vikings and their rage, you can imagine how the young men of Babylon might have just sat around their campfires talking about what all was to be had over there in little old Judah for the taking. Hezekiah had certainly given these guys a story to build on with his showing of all the treasures in his realm. But the thing is, Nebuchadnezzar just thought he took it. It says he took part of the vessels and the treasures, but he just thought he took it. Actually, uh, God gave it to him. God used him as a puppet in his hand, as he still does today. Bible believers know that God is in control And it's comforting to know that nothing happens to his people by chance, not to ancient Israel and not to us Christians today. Anything that affects us is part of his plan and his purpose. And Romans 8, 28 assures us it will all work together for our good. So when a God-fearing Israel protecting president doesn't get elected as we wished he had of, <laughs> as we would have liked, we can still rest easy. And when pestilence comes, such as COVID, we can still rest easy, knowing our God is in control and the world isn't falling apart. It is just falling into place, as I've heard that said recently. Uh, and it's a good statement to remember The actors on stage are just puppets in God's hands. We can rest. And really for the Christian that knows the Bible, we we can really rest because we can know the rapture is just on the horizon because so much Bible prophecy is falling into place right now in front of our eyes. As I've said before, we are living in biblical times. God used Babylon to chastise and teach his people some hard lessons about the consequences of sin and of turning from him to idolatry. And then he punished Babylon for all they did to Israel. God made life and he knows the best way for us to live it. Turning from his ways that are laid out for us in scripture never, never ends good. That's why he warns us against sin. Sin hurts. But turning from God to our own ways, it's like putting diesel in a machine that's made for gasoline. It just does not work. This Bible is our life. This Bible tells us how to live our life. It's our 
instruction book. It's our manual for living. For 40 years before the captivity, Jeremiah had been telling Judah what would happen if they didn't turn back to God. God gave them so many chances. In Jeremiah's book, we see, and I'll, I'll through the scripture actually, but in Jeremiah's book, you can read that one book and see it. We see God pleading with them as the father pleads with his children. We see him pleading with Judah and Israel as if they were an adulterous wife because of their turning from him to idols. But still, he tells them he will take them back if they'll just put the idols away and return to him. This had been going on ever since God brought them out of Egypt. They had cycles of rebellion and revival throughout their history as a nation. In Jeremiah 5, we're told that God would have pardoned Jerusalem if one humble man could be found there who looked for the truth. Jeremiah didn't have one convert in the 40 years he preached. Still, he continued on giving out the word of God as God had called him to do. It reminds me of how we Christians need to just keep on. Even when we get uh, discouraged, we need to keep on doing the same, giving out God's word, even when it seems no one is listening because God promises his word will not return void. If you've not read through the Bible, you need to understand that God's people were not just bowing down to idols, which would have been bad enough, but they were sacrificing their children. They were burning their sons and their daughters in fires to these gods as sacrifices to them. They were worshiping the sun, the moon, the host of heaven. You can see Jeremiah chapter 7 and chapter 8 and practically anywhere you open your Bible to. They were doing all the wicked things that the pagan nations around them had been doing. Everything God had told them not to do, that is what they were doing. Read Leviticus 18 to get an idea of what was going on. And it was horrible. Jeremiah's ministry was that of warning Judah to turn from the idol worship and his ministry was warning them of the captivity that would happen if they didn't because of the idolatry. He says in Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 4, Trust ye not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. They were trusting in their temple but not in the God of their temple. We have people today doing the same. They trust in their church, but won't open the Bible to read the scripture. They're not trusting in God. They're trusting in their church like Israel was of old. Instead of trusting God, they were trusting in their lying priest and their lying prophets. Jeremiah was a true prophet of God, God had given instructions in the Old Testament of how to test whether a prophet was truly of God or not. Jeremiah passed every test. Now we have the complete word of God and we should never trust a man to tell us what God wants us to know. John the Baptist was the last of the Old Testament prophets. God no longer works through prophets. Now it is through his written word. There are even more lying priests now than there was back then. So if you are depending on a priest, a pastor, or a teacher to tell you something, be sure that they back it up with Scripture. That's why I tell you every time, look in God's Word for yourself. I may be wrong. I'm just a human. We're all just human. We could be wrong. Nobody gets it 100% right. So it's good to have good pastors, good teachers, but still make sure, look for yourself, see for yourself what God's word says. The lying priests were telling Judah, oh, it's all okay, just do whatever you want. Besides worshiping the sun and the moon and the stars, they worshiped false father gods, false mother gods, and false newborn baby gods. 
The sun was worshipped as the father god. The moon was worshipped as the mother god. And the sun god was worshipped as the sun, S-U-N, God reborn. It's thought, and with good reason, that it all got its start at the Tower of Babel. I talked a little about this last time. The father god was Nimrod, also known as Bel or Murdoch. The mother god was Semiramis. The sun god was Tammuz. The besetting sin of Israel and of Judah was Baal worship, Satan's counterfeit religion. The names have been changed through the ages and cultures, but the God with the little g that is worshipped is the same in all cultures. It is Baal, also known as Satan. With the confusion of the languages at Babel, and I like to say Babel because it's Baal worship, with the confusion of the language at Babel, this worship spread into all cultures with only the names being changed due to the language change, but the gods and goddesses they worshiped all had one central story. In Egypt, it was Ra, Isis, Horus. In Greece, it was Zeus, Artemis, Adontis. In Rome, Jupiter, Diana, Apollo. In Nordic countries, it was Odin, Jora, Thor. Hindu was Vishnu, Chandra, Krishna. I may not be saying those names right, uh, right, but you get the gist of it. In our culture today, some sadly think of Mary, the mother of Jesus, as being a goddess, although they won't call her that, uh, but they do call her the Queen of Heaven. But Mary was not sinless. Mary needed a Savior too. And I thought so many times, if Mary was sinless, she could have died for her son. She could have died in Jesus' place. And most mothers would die in their son's place if they could. So if Mary had been sinless, I'm sure she would have said, No, God, let me, let me. Okay, I cannot prove Baal worship started with Nimrod, but from the research I've done, he is the most likely candidate for it. The stories of him, Semiramis and Tammuz, cannot be proven as a fact as far as I know, but with what we have to go on, it sure makes a lot of sense to me. And one thing is for sure that the worship of the Father God, Mother God, Son God got its start from somewhere and that it happened pretty soon after the flood when Noah and the family got off the boat. Since we have, uh, we, we see it in Egypt and those other places. They were practicing it when God asked Jeremiah, do you see what they're doing in Judah? Jeremiah seven eighteen. the children gather wood and the fathers kindle the fire and the women knead their dough to make cakes to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto other gods that they may provoke me to anger. These cakes symbolized Baal, the sun god. In Egypt, they were consecrate, consecrated by a priest to become the flesh of Osiris. Satan will counterfeit God as much as possible, right up to the end, going as far as having even a satanic trinity in the book of Revelation chapter 13. All of Satan's counterfeit religions of the world one day will be combined into a one world religion. All through the Bible, we're given glimpses of what it'll be like. Watch the news today. Be aware of anyone or any organization supporting any move toward a one world religion. In the Bible, it said they will cry peace, peace, peace when there is no peace. Is any religious system crying peace today? It's coming, a one world government and a one world religious system. All the way through the 52 chapters of Jeremiah's is how that over and over God pleads with his people, return to him, return, return, I'll take you back. But they continue on in their idolatry. They will not listen. They listen to their priest instead. 
God says to Jeremiah in chapter 16, when the people ask you, what is our sin that we've committed against the Lord our God? Then shalt thou say unto them, Because your fathers have forsaken me, saith the Lord, and have walked after other gods, and have served them, and have worshipped them, and have forsaken me, and have not kept my law, and ye have done worse than your fathers, therefore will I cast you out of this land into a land that ye know not, neither ye nor your fathers, and there ye shall serve other gods day and night, where I will not show you favor. This had been happening off and on, off and on, since the very beginning of the nation. So after the last 40 years of them being warned continually, the day finally came when God said, Bye-bye, see you later, like in about 70 years. So they were there in captivity in Babylon for 70 years. Now I want to show you just a little more clearly uh, what Babylon was like so you can get a real good understanding of why God put them there. At the time of the captivity, Babylon was a fabulously, magnificently thriving city. And it had been for quite a while. King Nebuchadnezzar was king and had added to the beautifying of the palaces and gardens of the cities. city. But long before he came along, there was Nimrod. Nimrod had started it. God stopped his building project of the Tower of Babel. But about 25 more remains of these tower-like structures have been found throughout the area, except they call them ziggurats. In um, Micah 5, 5 through 6, speaks of the land of Nimrod, which identifies him as being king over that land at one time. And it just seemed like the kings in the Bible loved building monuments to themselves. The palace of Nebuchadnezzar was bigger than the whole city of Jerusalem. In Daniel 4, verse 30, Nebuchadnezzar said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of my kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty. They loved building monuments to themselves. People in power still like doing that kind of thing. And I hate getting in a church where the first thing they do when I get in it is start a building program. I just, mm, I don't like that. I, I'm satisfied with, I'd be satisfied with meeting in a, a tin building, you know, and sending the money to missionaries. But let me get off of that now. <laughs> building programs are okay where they're needed, where they're needed, and sometimes they are. All right, that's all I'm going to say about that. Okay. <clears throat> so anyway, Nebuchadnezzar, he, is just, he built that for himself, the things he built. People in power are still doing that kind of thing. Antichrist will start building when he shows up. No doubt he will be very helpful to the Jews in building their temple and so gain their trust until he sets up an image of himself in it. Nimrod, with his attempt uh, for a one-world order at Babel is a picture of the Antichrist who will achieve it for a short while. From the time of Nimrod, Babylon and Nineveh were the leading cities of the world, and it's no wonder since Satan was reigning over them. I mean, he had them. <laughs> now, uh, about 500 years after Nimrod, to show you how, how Babylon was, about 500 years after Nimrod, King Hammurabi came on the scene. Some believe he was Amraphel, the king of Shinar, in the book of Genesis, chapter 14, verse 1. From Britannica.com and other online articles I read, uh, it says that as king, Hammurabi continued ancient building projects and restoring temples, city walls, and public buildings, digging canals, dedicating cult objects to the deities in the cities and towns of his realm, and fighting wars. His official inscriptions commemorating his building activities confirm this. Now this is a long, long time ago, people, before Nebuchadnezzar Daniel came along. 
So even during that time, Babylon is described as the richest, most magnificent, and most prosperous city in the world. It continued that way even after it was conquered by Medo Persia and Greece. Alexander the Great wanted to make it his capital. There were found remains there of one of the largest palaces in the history of the world. Babylon was a major trading area of the world with a population of about 200,000 people. It was the cultural center of the world with science, mathematics, literature, music, astronomy thriving there. It was in this time period they claimed to have invented the wheel, the bow, the plow, and irrigation, and several other inventions, including writing and the keeping of notes. One was a legal code of laws written by Hammy Ruby. In it, he called, he is called the exalted prince and worshiper of the gods. Many of these that were responsible for these inventions, now get this, claim the ideas were given to them by angels or aliens. And considering my YouTube study on Genesis 6, I believe there may just be something to that. I'd always pictured Abraham, Father Abraham, as being called from one dusty desert to go to another, but this is the area God called Abraham to come out of in Genesis 12. It was during King Hammurabi's reign. So Babylon has long been known as the gate of the gods. The whole area was pagan. Many, many, many years later when Nebuchadnezzar came along, Babylon was still very, very, very pagan. <clears throat> and was still a thriving city. And as far as the worshiping of false gods, things had just gotten worse, worse, worse. There were sun gods, moon gods, star gods, sea gods, gods of the underworld. There were daddy gods, mama gods, baby gods. All kinds of gods were worshipped there. By then, there were eight gates to the city, each one named after a god or goddess. The famous gate of Ishtar was built during his reign, and it led to the temple of Murdoch, also known as Baal. So all of this is where God put his people, right there in the middle of Satan's playground with all the idolatry they had run after all their lives, and all that they thought they wanted would make them happy ever since their beginning as a nation. God gave them what they wanted, but it didn't make them happy. From Psalms 137, we read, By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, yea, we wept. When we remembered Zion, we hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof, for there they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they that wasted us required us of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? was their reply. Through Jeremiah and others in the other parts of the Bible, God had told you to in Jeremiah 2.19, Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backslidings shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter, bitter, that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts. It's a good thing to fear the Lord. It's a good thing to have a little fear of the Lord. As we know, the word fear is not just reverence, it's fear. God is in control. He's able to do some stuff. <laughs> He's able to bring us back to Him. There comes a time when God will leave a person or a nation alone and let them have what they want. And that's the worst thing God can do is to leave us alone. But he eventually will if we keep refusing his call so that many times it is our own sin that chastises us and drives us back to him. It's a very, very painful way to 
to get back. And it doesn't have to be that way. Just turn back to God. His arms are always open, waiting on us to come back. Even though he's still there with us, he'll never leave us or forsake us. We're not going to feel his sweet presence when we get in a bad, sinful place where we will not return to him and continue on in our sin. So he withdraws his presence from us. Even though he's still with us, he withdraws from us. And it's a very sad, empty feeling. I've been there. I've been there. But thank the Lord. He he drew me back before I got too very far off. Since Israel just couldn't seem to get enough of that pagan religion, when God finally had enough, he put them right there in the center of what they'd always wanted so that maybe they would get enough of it, and they did. After the captivity of 70 years, they had nothing else to do with idol worship after then. On the other hand, even though Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah had to endure the same pain. These were good guys. These were God-fearing good guys. But they had to endure some of the same pain and really even worse for them. And we'll talk about that in another lesson. They still felt the sweet presence of God more than ever before. (laughs) Oh, God was so present with them in their pain. His presence was so felt. They didn't get all down and out and lose their appetite. Their countenance appeared fairer and fatter than all the others. They still praised God. They still gave thanks to God. Every time God showed himself in some way to either of these four men, I'm sure they just couldn't wait to get back to each other to tell them how God manifested himself to them. I can just imagine Daniel was like, let me tell you how God saved me from those lines. Let me tell you. (laughs) Let me tell you about the look on King Nebuchadnezzar's face when he looked into that den of lines and saw me still up walking about. And uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and that's uh, Nebuchadnezzar had changed their names to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but these were their Hebrew names. These guys would answer Daniel, well, let me tell you about that fiery furnace. Let me tell you about the look on the guard's face. And man, they just, they just went up in smoke because it was so hot while they were throwing us in there. They, they died right then and there. But we didn't. We didn't. I bet they told those stories over and over and over to each other. And who was around listening to those stories? The pagans were hearing every bit of it. They were hearing how great their God is. In their time of pain and sorrow, through every bad experience, they grew. They grew stronger, more courageous, and through their sufferings, they saw God more clearly, and His presence was felt more than ever before. And those around them were able to get a true glimpse of the one true God. How often do you magnify your God? How often do you praise God around others? It's something we should be doing. It's a little something. It's something so simple and something we all can do. Has God been good to you in any way? Have you been lucky or have you been blessed by your God? Everything good that comes to us comes from God. It's a blessing from God. Don't be ashamed to praise Him. You're going to grow through it, and you're going to be rewarded. God loves our praise. And um, for sure, for sure, for a while, they may have thought God had totally withdrawn Himself for them when they were having to march with the others into Babylon. I'm sure it seemed that way at first. But Daniel had already purposed in his heart to continue on believing in God, and the others followed his example. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, they followed his example. I don't know how many others did, but these did. It wasn't long until their belief was rewarded with sight. 
The world says seeing is believing, but God wants us to believe in order to see. Faith is to believe what we do not see and what we do not feel. It is to decide with our will to simply believe, and the reward of that faith is to see what we believe. Our faith will allow us to see God in the lion's dens of our lives, and it will allow us to see God in the fiery furnaces of our life. Be a Daniel. Be a Daniel. Believe and see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. God bless you. And uh, I, I, I hope to continue this study in Daniel. It's slow. Y'all know me. It's slow. I have to research everything. But uh, you, you continue it. And hopefully I'll get back with some more studies of mine for you. You do your studies. Please comment. Show me things, tell me things you've learned, and God bless you.